Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, Stephen Peinecker, and my good bud, Jonathan Neville, is in the house. Thanks, Jonathan, for coming back. Happy to be here. Love it. So before we get started, I got to do some shameless promoting, folks. So uh, go to mormonbookreviews.com. That's our merch store. Everything's like top of the line, brand name product. There's no cheap stuff on the website. So when you order, it's going to be good. We also, I ordered some buttons that didn't come in time for my meet and greet last <laughs> week. Uh, but I got, but they've got buttons. I just went on my website and saw now we have vinyl seat covers, MBR vinyl seat oh. covers. So it's pretty wild. Mouse pads, you name it. It seems like uh, it's great. So just check out mormonbookreviews.com if you wish to uh, support the program. If you want the merch, that's really cool. Also, just uh, my Patreons out there. I want to thank you so much for your monthly contributions. I also want to thank those who are also supporting the channel via P PayPal. And if you're interested in doing the same, I, uh, I'll leave links in the description. So Jonathan, before we get started, this is going to basically, we're going to be talking about your book, A Man That Can Translate. We're going to be talking about the translation process of the Book of Mormon and how you think that um, maybe the, uh, uh, the new, uh, the new uh, view of the translation using the seer stone, which is something that's foreign to many LDS folk until very recently, that perhaps there's flaws there and that you think you have a better uh, alternative to what mm -hmm. is the uh, Sith model, if you will, for that. But yeah. before we get started, I think it's important to acknowledge, um, uh, first of all, the two winners of your books for the drawing, which, by the way, by the time this airs, these will be in the mail, folks. So, so my two winners, these are on their way. Cool. Um, we did a, a drawing at the MHA, and that's where I want to start. So a couple weeks ago, last weekend, uh, you uh, gave a presentation to the Mormon History Association. I'd just like for you to talk a little bit about that and maybe kind of about the reception that you got. Okay, well, I was talking a little bit about kind of introducing Jonathan Edwards, the influence of Jonathan Edwards on uh, Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. And so I gave a little talk about it, but what, the significant thing that I did there was I announced that I have released the, my preliminary database of Jonathan Edwards, which we call the, uh, what do you call it, the non-biblical intertextual database. And it's on the MoBOM site. We'll put it in the show notes here if anyone wants to look at it. And I've been compiling this for several years. And it's, it's right now, the one I put up online is about 1,500 pages. And it, it goes through hundreds of uh, terms and uh, phrases that are non-biblical. They're not found in the King James Version, but they're in the Bible. And I found all of these in the works of Jonathan Edwards, which were available to Joseph Smith. And so during the, the presentation, I pointed out that uh, Joseph Smith frequented the bookstore there in Palmyra where that was just the printing shop also. And in that bookstore, they were selling the eight volume works of Jonathan Edwards that were published in 1808. And so I, I said, well, you know, my, my point of this was that whether or not uh, people have speculated about all these possibilities of influences on Joseph Smith, but here is almost all of the non-biblical language of the Book of Mormon was right available to him right in this bookstore that he frequented. So I mentioned that in the presentation. In, in the response, one of the, the respondents said that, well, there's no evidence that he actually read those books. And I thought, well, the evidence is in the text of the Book of Mormon. But he said that the incident that um, was referred to by the employee at the print shop where Joseph Smith came in and was a, a meddling lingerer, he said, well, in that case, he was talking about the printing process because they dabbed his face with black ink which was a good point, except that he was, if he was a lingerer, he could be doing a lot more things there than just getting in the way of the printing process. Right? And so, and in his whole life, Joseph was, was interested in printing. I mean, he always started a newspaper every town they went to and so on, but he was also very, um, I guess, even though he was unlearned in the sense of no formal schooling, he was very familiar with, they had an intimate acquaintance with those of different denominations, as he said. So I pointed all this out. So, you know, there's, there wasn't a lot of time for Q&A. Uh, one person in particular asked what I thought was kind of a dumb question. He said, if, um, how did Joseph Smith have time to read all these books when his family couldn't afford books? And the whole point was that they, he was at the print shop where he could read them on the shelf. He didn't have to buy the books. Plus, people were loaning books, and, and his mother talked about how his siblings would read books. So, you know, it was just kind of a, a bizarre. Well, and that's, that's the thing, because I was there when the question was asked, and I was like, yeah. first of all, he wasn't, they, did, he, he, they didn't buy the whole complete 1808 set of Jonathan Edwards' <laughs> books that you have. 
but a yeah. lot of these sermons were done in the pamphlets. So you could well, get too. pamphlets Absolutely. very inexpensively. Yeah. yeah. And, and I didn't take the time there to show, but one of the, um, the volumes has the sermon, you know, natural men are God's enemies. And juxtaposed to that is the completion of a, an article or a sermon on the temptations of Joseph. And when you read the temptations of Joseph, the first part of it, of course, is talking about Joseph in Egypt. But the first part of it has a lot of these non-biblical Book of Mormon phrases. And I, I just picture myself in Joseph's place. If I was reading the natural man as an enemy to God or Joseph's temptations, either one of those would both be of interest. And when you see all the non-biblical Book of Mormon language in those two articles, those two parts, I'm, I don't know, of course, no one knows if Joseph read all eight volumes. But if you can pick out certain parts of it that have a high uh, concentration, let's say, of non-biblical Book of Mormon language. And so to me, it just makes sense. I mean, I, this is a funny thing about historians it kind of came out of that. Historians are like these guys who they, they find a little scrap and they think that's the whole history. And yet, you know, you and I are having this conversation that's being recorded. If it wasn't being recorded, it would not exist unless one of us took notes of it. So in the entire universe of things that happen, only a small percentage are um, memorialized in any kind of a written format. And out of all the things that are, were written in the 1800s, only a small percentage of those still exist. So to say that this one little excerpt from um, a book, in this case, talking about the printing shop, that it could only have referred to the printing process and not to other time Joseph stayed in the store is, is a very narrow-minded kind of a, a closed approach. And that's what I see historians doing all the time. They, and I, I think one of the, you know, I might be elaborating too much on this, but what I observe all the time among historians is almost a, um, a lack of imagination is one way to look at it. When I used to practice law, you'd have a case and you'd have a set of facts, both sides, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case. And everybody would have their facts and their point of view. And the other side would have the diametrically opposite using the same facts. And in order to be effective as a lawyer, you have to be able to understand different ways of interpreting the same facts. And, and that's kind of what I see historians being apparently unable to do. And we'll talk more about that as we talk about the stone on the hat. But that became very evident in this, uh, in this brief Q&A we had at MHA. So just as we wrap up Mormon History Association, first of all, um, the, how did you enjoy it? And did you get the chance to maybe sit in some other presentations? Yeah, and, I did. And, the, and there, were, there were some awesome ones. Of course, there was one of my co-author with Jim Lucas when he talked about the, the translators. But I, I sat in a phenomenal one on LDS art and some of the changes and how we depict Christ and, and some of these other things, which were just fantastic. As an artist, you can see part of my studio in the background here. But um, I, I love that one. Uh, there, there were so many that you know. The, the biggest problem with MHA is there's so many sessions that you want to sit in, and they're concurrent. Fortunately, now we have the recordings, so we can listen to them all. But anyone who's interested in church history ought to at least check out the recordings. And the so proceedings. your your session was recorded, correct? Uh, as far as I know, yeah. Actually, someone told me that it was, so I have okay. to look at it myself. But okay, so only audio, not video. And so, if you're, and so you have access to it if you're a member of the Mormon History Association. And if you registered, right. then um, people would ask me, "Is your session when I posted on Facebook that I did it?" Yeah. And I said, "Well, no, it's only available uh, to members of the MHA who have right. registered." So, yeah. um, okay, so I'm looking. Oh, behind. but I oh. should mention also, I had two panelists that gave fascinating presentations. Yes really interesting about crime in Nauvoo was one of them that, uh, you know, I hadn't really thought that much about how that all worked. Or, or, you know, you read a little bit about it, but she really did a great job. And the other panelists had a phenomenal presentation that he's going to have articles coming out on the topic that'll be really interesting. So yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed sitting in on that session. And it, all three panelists, I thought were excellent. So probably one of the better panels uh, yeah, at the conference. Uh, so yeah. I'm looking back behind you and you got your infamous whiteboard, which I kind of <laughs> yeah. like, I think we got to keep this going. And on there behind me, I'm looking at Sith versus U and T. Sith versus U and T. Let's yeah. just start there. Okay, well, the, the Sith stands for stone in the hat. And that's a, an acronym that I've adopted that is becoming more widespread 
bread, I guess, apparently, from what I hear, because it's, it sums it up so well. It's a stone and a half theory that the whole Book of Mormon came from this stone and a half versus U and T, as you can see, the Urim and Thummim. Now, some people have tried to conflate the two terms, and I've talked about that before. I don't know if I mentioned it in this book, but they, they say, well, those terms are interchangeable, which I disagree with for the reasons we've talked about before. But as we get into that, let me just quickly review all the some of the books that I've that I've consulted or read through, because your viewers love Mormon books, right? So the first one, of course, is Stone the, or the Man That Can Translate, which is the one we're talking about. But then, of course, we have the 1830 Book of Mormon itself, right? Um, I'm just going to show these. We can, if you want to talk about them, we can. There's the David Whitmer Interviews book, which is out of print. It's hard to find. And there's some transcription errors in it. But for the most part, it's really good. You can see I've annotated it. Quite oh, wow. Yeah. There's uh, By the Hand of Mormon, Terrell Givens' book. Love that book. That has an, an interesting overview. There's lots of stuff in here I disagree with. But you know, at least it's widely known. There's uh, Rough Stone Rolling. Kind of the, the the quasi bible for the biography of joseph smith right and we'll have a link in the show notes of my comments on the stone and the hat in here so so people can read what i think about that yeah and i noticed that in your book you actually do kind of like have a, a response to rough stone rolling at the at the back yeah. of the book so yeah yeah and i have one online too that people okay. can look at this is producing ancient scripture a relatively recent one that I've made some notes in and, and discussed before. Then we have Insider's View of Mormon Origins yeah. by uh, Grant Palmer, yeah. whom I've met. And uh, he has he talks about the stone and the hat also, like everybody else. Yeah, and he's the one that commissioned the drawings for the stone and the hat because he couldn't find any. Uh, so he had to pay to have them made. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, it's funny. I, I, I like those drawings because of what they depict. Not because they're historically accurate, but because of what they depict. We'll talk about that maybe. Then, of course, there's No Man Knows My History. Lots of lots of good uh, Sith material in there. We've got uh, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview by uh, Michael Quinn, of course, everybody knows. That's why people know that I've read all these things and I've yeah. gone through them. Uh, Opening the Heavens which is uh, Jack Welch's compilation of early accounts. Oh. And you can get this online too. And I refer to this a lot in the book because I, I've gone through all of his accounts. And the biggest problem with this is like these other books, they all take everything out of context. Hmm. They take these little snippets. Like I was saying earlier, these historians take these little snippets and think that's the truth without understanding the, the larger context. And then uh, this one, by uh, Mike Hubbard McKay and Nick Frederick on the seer stones, Joseph Smith seer stones. I don't know if you've seen this one before. It's, I don't know how widely known this book is, but it, this one kind of um, was one of the things that led me to the conclusion that I reached on the translation. Now, which seer stone is that on the cover? That's just one of the white seer stones. Okay, got it. There's, you know, I have a replica of the, the church's one, a, a life-size accurate replica, and I, I forgot to bring it today, but <laughs> I also have a, a white stone that looks like this just for fun as okay. kind of a prop. Interesting. So th those are just a few of the books that I've read and gone through and analyzed and so on. Well, let me, let me just since we were talking about yeah. seer stones, um, yeah. you know, I, I've watched some of Rod Meldrum's programming and they seem to be very uh, opposed to the idea that Joseph Smith was a treasure digger or that that was right. kind of something like a, this, a, something that's a, not correct or true or is an attack. Um, yeah. Where do you stand on that? Because it seems to me that there seems to be a pretty good amount of evidence that Joseph did engage in treasure digging, which... To me, I always try to tell people that wasn't entirely uncommon, and people did use right. dowsing rods looking for treasure. This is not outside the context of even the Christian world that he was in. Where do you where do you stand on the treasure digging? Well, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery both joked about that, and in a sense, you could say they admitted it, but that's kind of a pejorative term because admitting something implies that there's something wrong with it. But they acknowledged it, let's say, and they joked about it. I mean, yeah, okay. So I was a treasure digger, and Oliver Cowdery made the point. I think it's in letter eight where he said, they say, Joseph dug up all the hills around Susquehanna, you know? <laughs> so it was like, 
neither one of them shied away from that. Yeah. And they both acknowledged, yeah, okay, I did some treasure digging. Big deal. But neither one of them ever said or implied that he used that seer stone for the translation of the Book of Mormon. Got it. And so, you know, I, I know um, the Stoddards in particular say that he never used a seer stone. And I, I think, well, you know, people are entitled to their opinion. But I think that his, if Joseph and Oliver admitted it, either I use that pejorative word again, mm -hmm. if they acknowledged it. And other people said they saw it, multiple people said they saw it. It's hard for me to grasp how they could have all been lying and why Joseph and Oliver would have joked about it that way. Mm. You know, so I don't agree with them. I, I think I've read their book. I think they've omitted some of the important references. For example, right in um, Palmyra and, and uh, Rochester, right in, I think it was in July or August of 1829, the newspaper article said Joseph put spectacles in a hat. Now, obviously, there wasn't the Urim and Thummim he put in there because nobody was allowed to see that. So there's problems with that account too. But it didn't originate from the apostasy in Kirtland, as they like to say it. So that's just an area that I disagree with them. I mean, people yeah. can believe whatever they want. But I, I think if you look at the historical accounts, you have to acknowledge, you could say admit, that Joseph used a seer stone at some point for whatever reason. And as I recall, it seems to me that Emma's father said that Joseph told him he never really saw anything in the seer stone. Hmm. I think I've seen that quotation, which makes sense because it, it, anyway, that's we may get there or not. I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Well, just continue. I'm I'm fascinated by this okay. topic. I love your book. And uh, okay, okay. Well, I, I have a little bit of an outline up here yeah. on the whiteboard. So the first thing is. Sith versus Urim and Thummim. Uh -huh. and, and I should point out that that's a, a contradiction. I mean, the, there are people who claim that it's the same word, interchangeable. Sometimes you use Urim Thumb time, Urim and Thummim, sometimes you use a seer stone. But I think it's pretty clear from Mormonism Unveiled, if nothing else, that those are two distinct ideas. Because right in that book, he says, yeah, some people say you use the stone and that, other people say you use the Urim and Thummim, right? And that was in 1834. And it was in response to that book that Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith wrote those eight historical essays. So to me, it's pretty obvious they were two different concepts that we're talking about. And the other thing from a substantive level or a religious level, it makes a big difference because the Urim and Thummim was uh, you know, prepared by God, let's say touched by the finger of God, like the, the stones that Brother Jared had and included with the plates specifically for the purpose of translation. So there's a, a divine power associated with those two stones in the Yerma Thumma. The seer stone everybody talks about, like the one on this, the cover of this book, or the one that uh, the church published recently, the, the brown one with the stripes on it. Those are just regular rocks. We can look at them today and see them. And they're just a stone like you could pick. I wish I had my replica here, but <laughs> they, uh, they're just rocks. And that's com two completely different things. Now, I know at the at Mormon History Associ Association, the idea came up of kind of an animism approach that every physical object has some inherent divine creative potential, something like that, which I, I'm not articulating it the way I probably should. But the idea is that anything can be imbued with divine power. But that's not what we talk about in the scriptures and what Joseph Smith explained, because these, the Urim and Thummim were specifically designed and intended and prepared and imbued with divine power to assist with the translation. You know, just really interesting, fascinating to me because, you know, I talked to Richard Bushman about this when I did my interview with him, where I talked about how he seemed, Joseph seemed to be more fascinated by the spectacles than the plates themselves. Right. It was just very yeah. descriptive of them and, and, and thought, found them to be of high interest. I want to ask you, when is when do we have on record when Joseph Smith first referred to the spectacles as the Yerman Thummim? You know, the only the earliest reference that I'm aware of was 1832. And it was, I think Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith were quoted in a newspaper in Boston. And it just kind of in passing, they just said Joseph used the Yerman Thummim. And that's really interesting to me because they had to learn that from somewhere. Now, a lot of people thought it was Phelps in 1833 in the Messenger and Advocate, but that was subsequent to this earlier reference. 
So Phelps, if you read Phelps's article about that, it sounds like he's trying to explain the Urim and Thummim to people familiar with the Bible, but it was not the first use of the term. And so when we have the Orson Hyde and, and Samuel Smith account from 1832, this is another example of what I, I mentioned earlier, where we, in all of history, only a few things are recorded and we only have a few of the things that were recorded. So we don't know when the first use of that term was. We know that of the extant uses that we have today, the earliest was 1832. And I'm glad you brought this up because here's, this is a point that I haven't made in the book and maybe I'll do it in a revised book. But the, you know, some people say, well, Joseph changed the revelations later to add, insert the Urim and Thummim, like in DNC 10 or whatever. And we know that's an accurate statement because the earliest in the Book of Commandments, it doesn't refer to the, um, but I see it that he was trying to clarify because the earliest commandments, he understood what was involved with it, what the Lord meant and so on. But after Mormonism Unveiled came out in 1834, he had to clarify and, and make unambiguous what those revelations were intending to say. So he inserted the Urim and Thummim because that's what he knew that it was referring to originally. Other people, historians, faithful and critical, both say that, well, Joseph inserted that later to kind of change the narrative. I don't see it that way at all. I see it as him clarifying the narrative, making it unambiguous so that people didn't believe it was the seer stones, which is a key point, I think. So that's that's the only answer I have for your question right now. Yeah, no, it's interesting. But, I just find that aspect, the whole idea of spectacles, seer stones, all these things are fascinating to me because you, you can go yeah. different directions. I think you're making a very solid argument in your favor. People can make pretty solid arguments in, in the other way too. Sure. But like I said, multiple working hypotheses. I'd like that. You know, okay. just you're you're submitting this, and I find this to be, uh, you know, to me, a lot. I think a lot of Christians are like, boy, it's so messy. Uh, yeah. Early Mormonism is so messy, and and I thought, well, yeah, but I think that our scriptures, early his, church history, was also very messy. <laughs> Uh, to say the least, yeah. yes. But we don't know about it because the, the only yeah. documents that have existed are the ones that the church is uh, preserved, as opposed to right. we don't we don't have uh, a more uh, Christianity unveiled public, public yeah. uh, written right. in the first century. Well, you know, I had a Christian friend that we we talked about all this stuff, and he said, "Well, you know, Joseph Smith was had just had so many issues." And I said, "If you get Isaiah, Isaiah is just a pure book." And I say, "Well, we don't know anything about Isaiah." essentially. We know a few little scraps of overview. We have no idea what he was like on an individual basis or what other things he may have written and all that, you know. So, and, and Oliver Cowdery made this point right in letter, I think it was letter number two or letter number three. He specifically talked about the problem of not knowing what the ancient prophets were like. All we have is their writings. And if to do the equivalent with Joseph Smith, you'd have to ignore all the biographical information and just look at the scriptures. As soon as you start delving into his personal uh, failings or inconsistencies or whatever, you can't do that with the biblical writers. So it's really an unfair comparison. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. So yeah, let's yeah. continue uh, continue with your outline. Okay, so so getting back to the Sith versus Urim and Thummim, I think it's more than just historical interest. And I point out here that um, Dan Peterson, John DeLynn equals John DeLynn. Jack Welch equals the CES letter, because on this point, they all agree now that Joseph Smith uses the stone in the hat. And to me, that's just preposterous. You know, I, I think, how, how can you possibly expect people, nor, I, I, I'm going to say there's two categories of people. There's some people who will believe no matter what, right? In every religion, every political philosophy, I mean, we, have, we see in our country right now, there's people who believe a political philosophy that just doesn't make any sense and doesn't work. It doesn't fit the laws of economics, but they still hold to it, right? And we have people in every religion that are just core believers. Don't, don't confuse me with the facts, right? When I was on my mission in France, we, had, we knocked on doors of Catholics all day long, and they would always say, I'm not interested. I don't want to know anything bad about my church, you know, whatever. So we, we have Latter-day Saints that are going to believe. In the, the, I mean, they've turned the stone in the hat from a bug into a feature, right? 
And, and I know some people, I think Kwaku is one of them that says, oh, it's awesome to have a stone and a half. That's even better than a translation. <laughs> okay, if that works for you. And I'm told, I, in my own experience in Africa isn't this way because people in Africa that I know like the translation better. But I'm told there are some people joining the church there that love this idea of the stone and the half because it's more magical, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. If people want to believe that, that's cool. But I think it, from my perspective, I'm more analytical and, and uh, practical, pragmatic, I like to say. And for me, the idea of a stone on the hat just undermines the entire narrative. You might as well throw away the plates, the, everything that Joseph said. And other people have pointed that out as well, not just me. But I mean, yeah. And that's why I think John DeLynn and CES Letter and those guys keep emphasizing. I think John said that the stone in the hat is the number one thing that he causes people to start losing their faith, right? And, and some of these books that I mentioned here. And so, but you have people like Richard Bushman, who for, at least for when he wrote the book, believed the stone in the hat, and he's still faithful. And, that, and that's, I don't have any, I'm not trying to say people can't be faithful while believing the stone in the hat. Just for me, it doesn't make any sense. And I think it contradicts the history. And contradicts what Joseph and Oliver taught. And I think we're all familiar with the problem in the church right now. I think something like 21 states lost LDS membership in the last couple of years, and they've been consolidating stakes in England and California and Japan all over. And, and there's a sense, I think, among young people, when they encounter the stone on the hat, it's like, well, I don't want to believe in the stone in the hat. And, and I've seen people uh, some LDS apologists trying to make a feature out of it, but it, bottom line, it's not a feature. Mm. And that's why I want to go through. That's why I wrote this book, actually. Mm. Okay, so that's why I put up on here that Dan Peterson, John DeLynn, Jack Welch, and CES that are all saying the same thing. And I think they're all wrong. Okay. Then the next thing on here, I put bad apologetics leads to worse apologetics. Okay. And, and that's, that's kind of the theme of this whole topic. Because I think the stone and the halves we'll talk about really arose as a, a bad apologetic effort to contradict the Solomon Spaulding theory. Okay. And as a result, now today, you have all these uh, people at Fair Mormon, Book of Mormon Central trying to persuade people to accept the stone and the half. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of anything more destructive of the whole foundation of the Book of Mormon than that. All right, so um, should we just go through the timeline? Is yeah, that... so this is what I find interesting because okay. I read the chapter where you discussed that you think there's a, there's a conventional wisdom that maybe about, it was comprised over the course of maybe 74 days. We're talking about post uh, 116 pages lost. So we're talking about Mosiah priority. So uh, third chapter of Mosiah on to the end and then goes right. back and then fills in with the, the lost 116 pages that are covered, which you believe is with the small plates of Nephi. Um, right. So basically um, you're actually contending or making the case that it actually, the timeline is much longer than what the conventional narrative is. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And it's important for a couple of reasons. First off, it was David Whitmer who said it took eight months. And when you read the accounts, Joseph, after he lost 116 pages, he had to give up the Urim and Thummim and then and the plates, although it's an ambiguous what he had to give up. But the point is, in September, he got them back, September of 1828. And although some people debate that even, but you know, when you read his record, especially in light of what his mother said, it looks like it was in September, that same September uh, date. And so he got them back. And then he said, after he received them back, he resumed translating with them as a scribe. And that's what he told his mother. That's what she reported. And so I, I made a little calendar here to show that because he got it back in September. October was presumably he was still working on farm issues and so on. So you start in November when he would, in winter time there in, in Harmony, November, December, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. So that fits with what David, or, yeah, David Whitmer said. The interesting thing is that we know that in April was when Oliver Cowdery showed up. And from the original manuscript, we can see that Oliver Cowdery's writing starts with Alma. Just for, as in terms of background, we don't have the original manuscript for the Book of Mosiah that's been lost or destroyed. At least it hasn't shown up yet. 
And so, by the way, I have the this um, volume five of the Joseph Smith papers. It has the original manuscript in it. We'll put a link to my comments about that too, if, if you'd like. But um, so we know that Oliver Cowdery was writing in Alma, but we don't know who wrote Mosiah. And there's indications, as I point out in the book, that it was Emma and Martin Harris, possibly what I call pre-Oliver scribes who would have written the Book of Mosiah. And there's several reasons to think that Oliver Cowdery did not write it. One of them is that when he copied the printer's manuscript, in, in the Book of Mosiah, it talks about Helam. And Oliver Cowdery wrote Helaman and then had to cross off the last two letters because he was familiar with the Book of Helaman later on in the Book of Mormon that he wrote. But that to me is an indication he didn't write the Book of Mosiah or he would have known it was Helaman in the first place. So he was copying presumably Emma's handwriting when he did that. So my contention is that uh, Emma was the, the main scribe, possibly with Martin Harris, maybe her brother, whatever, that were the scribes for the Book of Mosiah from November until March. And what that indicates is that it was a laborious process, which David Whitmer said it was. And it, so it took them a long time and Emma had other things to do and they had, all had other things to do. And so that's why, it was taking so long that Joseph prayed for uh, someone to come and help him full time, maybe a better scribe. And that would have been Oliver Cowdery when he showed up. So by the time Oliver Cowdery showed up, he started in Alma. And they did Alma through the, the title page in Fayette through uh, in April and May. The reason that's significant is when you expand that translation time, it means it took longer to translate than people have assumed. In other words, if you if you consider Mosiah through um, the title page in only two months, that's a faster rate of translation than just Alma through the title page. Okay, and I have all the calculations for that in the book. So then, when they went up to Fayette here in June, now there's a gap here because they traveled from Harmony to Fayette during the first part of June, and that's when they. Joseph had given the bridge plates to the messenger who took him to Kamora. And then the messenger brought the plates of Nephi to Fayette. So there are two different sets of plates. We've, we've talked about that before. But what's significant here in Fayette was, I, as I understand the, the text and reading the original manuscripts and so on, there are two kind of phases of the translation. The first phase involved uh, it was Dave, or, um, John Whitmer, Christian Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery were the scribes on, from first uh, Nephi through part of second Nephi. We only have the first uh, chapter or so of second Nephi in the original manuscript. Most of second Nephi has been lost. And then there, I think there's a passage or two from Enos, as I recall, and that's it. So, and on those we have, we can see the handwriting of Oliver Cowdery, Christian Whitmer, and John Whitmer in first Nephi. And that's interesting because we have, there's indications that Emma did not accompany Joseph and Oliver when they went up to Fayette. So she wouldn't have been a scribe for the first Nephi. But David Whitmer said she was a scribe. And the, the printer said he saw her handwriting on the, on the uh, manuscript. So that suggests that she may have been a scribe for the second Nephi portion. And the other thing that I point out in the book, well, let me, let me go, come down here to this idea of the demonstration. So this is maybe the most controversial thing <laughs> that I'm advocating. And, but I've talked about it with a lot of people and, and I've had feedback on it, pro and con, you know, but I think it's starting to, to take a little bit of a hold because it makes sense. And here's the idea. When, when Joseph and Oliver and John Whitmer and Christian Whitmer were doing the translation, they were working upstairs in the Whitmer home. And John Whitmer actually said that Joseph was using the plates in the Ermine home. That's something people have skipped over for some reason, but Zenas Gurley interviewed him and said, that's what he said. So there was no stone in the hat. Neither Oliver Cowdery nor John Whitmer ever said anything about a stone in the hat. So they were translating upstairs and they had a, um, in, feel, by the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have questions. Well, I, I actually wanted to, uh, first of all, this demonstration thing is, is fascinating. We, we actually talked a little bit about it on one of my previous interviews, but I wanted to, to discuss right. it. But I, I, before, before we continue, I just one thing I, that kind of sticks out is as an outsider, I consider David Whitmer to be the most 
reliable or most believable mm -hmm. witness of them all. Right. Um, because he, he could have, he, I'm just saying, he had a testimony of the Book of Mormon to the very end. Um, he did believe that Joseph Smith fell. Um, he mm -hmm. could have had very good reasons to have renounced his testimony. But maybe just talk about how important, why, or why if David Whitmer says something, maybe we should probably give more weight to that than maybe the other witnesses. Yeah, absolutely. Well, David Whitmer, first of all, he was the longest living. Well, I, I don't know him and Martin Harris, but David, Martin Harris was a little bit crazy a lot of the time, right? Right. So David Whitmer was a solid guy all along. He was, he was curious in the project because he knew Oliver Cowdery and they exchanged correspondence and so on. And so he was kind of following this from before the Book of Mormon was ever even translated. And of course, the, the Lord had told Joseph Smith through the Urim and Thummim to contact David Whitmer. And David, Joseph didn't even know the guy, but Oliver did. So Oliver wrote the letter. David picked him up and they had that miraculous experience with the crops. And then he had the miraculous uh, account where Oliver Cowdery had written down his trip to Fayette or to Harmony. And as they re resumed the journey back to Fayette, he, Oliver said, well, Joseph said, you stayed at this hotel or this house. And, and David said, yeah, I did. That's amazing. You know, that kind of a thing. But David also was the first one other than Joseph and Oliver to, to meet this messenger that took place to Kimura. So that, and he remembered the first time he ever heard the word Kimura. So he has a lot of credibility and I give him, as you point out, he's one of the most credible witnesses there is. One of the things that he admitted was that he wasn't around for most of the translation. He was, he, he was probably working on the farm like everyone else, but he did describe this demonstration that we'll talk about. The thing with witnesses though, no matter how credible they are, if you don't cross-examine them, they have a tendency to conflate their observations with their assumptions. That's a very common thing. Almost every court case you, you encounter this, and that's why you have the opportunity for cross-examination. Where you can say, did you really see this or did you just, you just assume it? And we've talked a little bit about that before. But to me, that's David Whitmer. Um, that describes David Whitmer's uh, testimony because he, he said that he never looked in the hat, he never looked in the stone, and yet he's telling us what appeared on the stone. So, by definition, it's at, at the minimum, it's hearsay. But it looks more like an assumption because he has some different variations of, of what he described about that. I mean, when you look at this book, the David Whitmer interviews, <laughs> it's, it's like you're talking to different people on, in every interview. And yet there's, there's a consistent theme throughout, which is that he's trying to support the, the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. But the details are all over the place. And that's why I see, getting back to this idea of the bad apologetics, at least the worst apologetics, I think David Whitmer's entire life, well, first of all, I should say, I, I think he really had a, an experience with Moroni, the angel that showed him the plates. He was consistent throughout his life about that. Very matter of fact about it. He also would talk about that messenger. They were two different people. He had conversations with both of them. So he knew they were different people. And those, those are all indicia of credibility and reliability because of the, the kind of details that he would bring out. But there's a clear distinction between when he would say what he observed and then what he inferred or assumed. And I think he, in fact, this is where I, I pointed out the problem with this book, where they, he just has all these excerpts, but not in context. If you read David Whitmer's writings, just as little blurbs, or a sentence or two without understanding the overall context, you miss the point. And, and whenever he was talking about the, the stone and the hat, especially in his pamphlet to all believers in Christ, he was he prefaced it by talking about the Spalding theory and how the Spalding theory was not what had happened. Joseph didn't have anything to read from. He was, you know, he emphasizes this over and over. Then he talks about the stone and the hat to prove it. And what I see him doing is relying on this demonstration to refute the Spalding theory. And we don't, you know, in our day, we don't really think much about the Spalding theory because we feel like it's been debunked. In, in the late 1800s, you know, they found the manuscript in Hawaii and all that, which I don't think is a very persuasive debunking, but that's another topic. <laughs> but the point is that it, most of us feel like it's a nothing, it's been debunked. 
even Fon Brody considered it debunked. So we don't, we don't appreciate how much of an issue it was in the 1800s. And I, in fact, we talked about this maybe when Oliver Cowdery rejoined the church in Boer's final testimony to, about the Book of Mormon, he emphasized Martin or um, Sidney Riggin didn't write it and Solomon Spaulding didn't write it. That's how critical it was that he include that. So I, what I see David Whitmer as well as Emma doing is refuting the uh, Spaulding theory by relying on the demonstration. And I think what it's interesting too, because Spaulding was very significant. It was the main counter narrative mm -hmm. to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It mm -hmm. was widely believed by Protestant America to be the story. Yep. Um, yep. And what I find fascinating is I can almost see how the they didn't want to make Joseph a translator in the conventional sense. They wanted him to be more of a seer who's reading these things off a rock. And so that yeah. he is not involved in the translation process at all, because if he's involved in it and he's using outside materials, then it bolsters the Spalding theory. And right. so when people, you come across with infinite goodness and you realize Jonathan Edwards is all over this, John, that, that, that Joseph Smith's, um, world is part of influences the text of the book of mormon and the translation process to the point that even brigham young says if it was written at a different time it would be a completely different book in right. other words um maybe the idea was is we have to almost attach it to a magical object that joseph was yeah. just reading off of because if we imply that there's any outside influence then the spalding theory is given a lot of credence right and and what's what's fascinating about this is the lds leaders, successors to Joseph Smith, all emphasized the plates and the, and the Urim and Thummim. It was the people like David Whitmer, Emma, others who opposed the people in Utah, right? the successors. And even Joseph uh, Smith III ended up agreeing with the Urim and Thummim, rejecting the seer stone. But they all felt like the seer stone was effective in refuting the Spalding theory. And, and uh, you know, it's funny because it's hard to, to put ourselves in their frame of mind when they thought they were doing something really faithful. It's kind of like the, the apologists today, Dan Peterson, Jack Welch, those guys, they think they're bolstering faith by this stone and hat narrative. And the evidence is right in front of us. We can, everybody can see declining membership, declining, you know, people leaving the church, youth not staying in the church, which is inevitable because that was the reasons the uh, Mormonism unveiled promoted that in the first place. They were trying to destroy the church, not build it up. So <laughs> to see the modern apologists adopting, you know, one time a couple of years ago, I put, uh, I mocked up an Ensign magazine and I put Mormonism unveiled on the cover. I said, why don't we just go all the way, right? <laughs> because that's what they're doing. And, you know, I, I don't know. It, it just seems to me that, that the, the bad apologetics is the problem, not the underlying uh, teachings. Well, this is the thing, too, is that the people there still came from a magical worldview. They thought the legitimate way to find water yeah. was through water witching. So they would say, well, this is how we found the water through this. Well, process. on that, let me stop you right there, because I, I use water witching myself when I was a landscaper. Uh -huh. It's the only uh -huh. way you can find underground sprinklers as you use the rods and you always find them. Find so the that's, sprinklers. that actually works. <laughs> okay. But, but the idea is, is that um, people are going to use the arguments they think best bolster yeah. their case. That's right. That's and right. so in their mind, using the stone in the hat argument actually is, a, a, it, it's a supernatural explanation. It ac actually brings divinity into the process. Right. And therefore you're bolstering it. You're making it more, if you will, Christian, even though a Christian today would not look at this occult object as being Christian. Well said. Yeah, uh, exactly. So I think that, I think there's something to this whole thing. And, and I know in some of these books, they point out that there is also an apologetic effort to make Joseph Smith unlearned. Now, he had to be unlearned because of the Isaiah prophecy, and he used that a lot to say, well, I was unlearned, you know, and he was technically unlearned because he hadn't gone to school, but it didn't mean he was ignorant or illiterate, and yet David Whitmer's another one. I think he, David Whitmer even said he was illiterate at one point, and, and Emma tried to make it sound like he couldn't write a letter when we have a letter that he wrote that was perfectly fine, so that some of their apologetics are almost blatant ridiculous 
And we can see that now in retrospect. And this stone in the hat was like that too. Because you're right. It, I mean, I, I guess in their mind, it made it more miraculous and divine to say it all came through pure revelation or something. Mm. So, but so, so we, but like you said, you said earlier, we still have the, how do we reconcile the, the accounts, right? right? Go ahead. You had another question. Oh, well, I just think that so, just getting back to the demonstration. So, basically, what you contend is that um, Joseph was basically, okay, guys, we, they're begging, they want to see something happen again. Joseph is using the stone in the hat because this is not foreign to these people, right? right? So he figures, okay, I can pretend, just like maybe he pretended with the treasure digging, uh, to do this. And you contend that what he was doing was he was actually just by memory, um, reading uh, from memory, uh, uh, reciting pa uh, some passages right. from Isaiah. And you believe right. that that actually makes itself into the Book of Mormon because they are writing it down. And then he does his demonstration. And he's like, okay, guys, let's get back upstairs and, and engage the plates like we've been doing all, all right. along. Is that a good summary? That, that's, that's possibility B. Possibility okay. A is that we don't know what he was dictating because right. nobody said. Nobody in the Whitmer home said, I was there when he quoted, you know, second Nephi 3, 4, whatever. They all just said we watched him as he dictated. So we know he was dictating words. We don't know what the words were. In fact, as, I, as far as I know, the only one we know for sure, or roughly for sure, where he was actually dictating what, when, was when Oliver Cowdery said, when we came across the baptism thing, you know, we went out and got baptized. So we know they were in Third Nephi there. But other than that, there was very little record, if any record, of what he was translating when. In fact, for a long time, people thought that he started at the beginning. And the Mosiah priority only came about because of the original manuscript, because we know in the first Nephi is written in the hands of the Whitmer brothers, as we mentioned, and they were never down in harmony. So if it wasn't for having that original manuscript and Royal Skousen's outstanding work on all that, we still might have a first Nephi priority. You know? So th there's this kind of... Um, I don't know, it, it, there's a lot of I, people have ideas or assumptions and they become reality. But when we actually look at the original sources and what they're saying, it can change our perception. Mm -hmm. So when it was this one account that, that the newspaper, I can't remember which one it was right now, Kansas City Journal maybe, that talked about this demonstration. And they said that they had it, they set up the table downstairs in the Whitmer home. Most of the translation took place upstairs in the small bedroom that's still set up now that way. But they had the members of the Whitmer family and some of Joseph's family around the table and they had the three scribes set up and Joseph was dictating and the scribes had to take turns, right? Which tells me that it was a rapid translation because normally, you know, Oliver Cowdery wrote most of the manuscript and even in First Nephi, we can see the Whitmers were writing for several pages. And so to have the three scribes taking turns sounds like Joseph was dictating at a faster pace. And that's why the getting back to this timeline is so important because if you look at the timeline with the eight month timeline, it was taking Joseph longer to translate than we would otherwise assume with the 72 day timeline, except for this, this demonstration, which I think was in second Nephi. So getting back to your, your point, the first point is that we don't know what he dictated. But assuming he was dictating the man, <laughs> what became the manuscript, it would have been Second Nephi because Emma was one of the scribes and she wasn't there for First Nephi. It would have been a rapid pace because they had three people taking turns. And when you look at uh, the Isaiah chapters in Second Nephi, it's always been a puzzle among scholars about why there's these few disparities between the King James and the a Book of Mormon. Now, there's a few chapters in Isaiah in 1st Nephi and the first ones in 2nd Nephi where Joseph added significant content. So the, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the ones that are basically exact replicas of King James with a few dropped words, inverted lines, things like that, that, that there's no support in any original manuscripts for those variations. And just so you know, Kobe Townsend has just uh, released a work about that. He talks about uh -huh. that very thing in his, his latest work as well. Okay. What does he say? 
about it. Well, he just demonstrates how the, so much changes were made at the beginning. And then as you go further and further down the text, there's less and less uh, corrections, yeah. if you will, that are being made to the text. Exactly. Well, well Royal Skousen has a whole book on the King James, and, the, and he goes through that too. And that's actually, that's one of the other things that led me to this demonstration idea. Because, you know, I've seen, I've seen some scholars trying to figure out why was this one word dropped? You know, why was this inverted? They have all these theories for it. And it, when I looked at it, I said, well, that looks like when I try to memorize something, I don't get it exactly right every time, right? And I've, I used to have to learn Latin and Greek and I would recite things from memory and so on. And inevitably I would lose a couple of words. And that's exactly what those chapters of Isaiah look like to me. So what I surmised is that Joseph Oliver up translating, um, the Whitmers had a, a girl working for them, a, a house worker. And she, she saw Joseph and Oliver come down from a translation session and they were, she said they were glowing and it freaked her out. She was gonna quit if, if she didn't know what was going on. And so in my view, anyway, that's one of the things that prompted this demonstration. You know, uh, Gurley said that Joseph showed the seer stone to satisfy the awful curiosity of his supporters. And that epitomizes this whole idea of a demonstration. So I can see Joseph Smith up there. And by the way, here's another thought that I don't think I put in the book. Why did Joseph Smith emphasize so often that he couldn't show, that the Lord told him not to show the plates in the arm and thumb? He could have said it once. He could have not even mentioned that, but he emphasized that and that he would be destroyed if he did. And I thought, well, why would he make such a big deal about it? And I think it gets back to this idea of the demonstration because he knew that he could not show people the plates. And there, there's a good reason for that if you want to get into it, but he couldn't show those. So he said, well, how am I going to satisfy the Whitmers, explain to them how the translation works, keep this girl working here at the house and, and on all these things without showing them. You know, I can't, I can't actually show them the translation, but I can tell them kind of how it works. And so he said, I, what I envision him doing is talking to Oliver, say, hey, I just translated a couple chapters of Isaiah's. You know, I'm using the King James language because that's what everybody's familiar with. I know these chapters by heart. Let's just go down, I'll do a demonstration We'll give them the idea how it works. You can, you and Emma and, and uh, Christian can write them all down and then we'll come up and finish the translation. So, so you that's could, what this was a diver, diversionary tactic by Joseph that you could argue he's doing this because he wants to get people off the scent of the plates and he wants to use another object that draws their people's attention to that so that then he doesn't have to be, because he had issues with people trying to get those plates right. in the first place. So right. I think he's using a diversionary, I mean, this is a counter narrative, one way of me just thinking off the top of my head, but he's using yeah. a diversionary tactic so that he, because if he really believes that if he shows those plates to anybody, he could be struck dead. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe using the stone in the hat might be a good diversion. What, what do you think? That, that's another equally plausible, well, plausible scenario as well. Multiple working hypotheses. It's kind of like when he told that guy that the bag of, he didn't have plates, he had a bag of sand. So that was a diversionary tactic also to get him off the scent, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's the same thing. I, that makes sense with the stone and the hat too, to say, look, you know, here's a stone. I'm putting it in here. It's a seer stone. And he knows he can't read anything off that stone. It was never touched by the finger of God or anything, just found in a well. And that's why when he was done, he gave it to Oliver Cowdery and said, I don't need this anymore. In other words, I don't need to do any more demonstrations. But so he, he goes down, recites Isaiah, they get the idea that this is a divine thing. I, I don't even, you know, I could see him saying, I'm going to show you how the translation works. That's all he would have to say. They would make the inference. In fact, it could be at the time they knew that it was not the real translation, that it was just a demonstration. And later on, that kind of morphed into, oh, I, we saw him do the translation because if they said, well, he was upstairs behind a curtain the whole time, then that's the Spalding theory, right? That's where, that's where he and Oliver had this problem because they knew no one had seen the plates. So theoretically, Joseph could have been reading the Spalding manuscript. And yet they both knew that he wasn't because they knew he was using your own thumb and the plates. But they couldn't show that to anybody. So it could even be that Joseph saw this as a way to defeat claims that he was copying another book. So there's lots of possibilities. But, but the key point is when, when I go through the evidence and I look at what 
people said they actually observed versus what they inferred, it becomes a lot more clear mm. because nobody looked in the hat. Nobody saw what was written on there. But they, all they saw was Joseph put a stone in the hat, put his face in and dictate words. That's it. Everything beyond that is speculation. And it makes sense for me. When I, when I read the original manuscripts, all the Isaiah stuff, <clears throat> consider the, this new timeline that I outlined here, how it was, our Dave Whitmer said they worked from morning till, till evening. And in New York at those times, that's like 14 hour days. And he said it was laborious work. And yet on this one time, he comes downstairs, dictates so fast that three scribes have to keep up. To me, that was not a translation. The other thing, and I've pointed out some examples in the book of how Joseph would, would always tell the exact truth, but he'd let people make inferences of things, right? And I think when, when he and Oliver Cowdery always said that Joseph translated the place with the Urim and Thummim, they weren't referring to the demonstration, which was not a translation. So technically, they always said exactly what was right. So that's another element of it. Interesting stuff. Uh, I wanted to just maybe... Be I wanted to move on and just talk about a couple other things. Was there anything else that you wanted to impart no. to the audience? So you pretty well... I think we covered everything. The swallowing theory, demonstration. Okay. So, yeah. So one of the things we talked about off camera was, um, okay, so a lot of the arguments that people use in favor of the Book of Mormon is the chiasms, the chiastic structure, mm -hmm. uh, the Hebrew poetic form that's used within the Book of Mormon. Um, I personally, just as an outsider, I'm not entirely convinced of that of that argument. I think it's people who believe in the Book of Mormon see something there. I've talked to outside scholars who are non-LDS who have engaged the text of the Book of Mormon, and they do not believe that there is an underlying Hebrew uh, text that it's being worked off of. Um, mm -hmm. And also the fact is, is that we can find chiasms outside of uh, the Book of Mormon, um, and it could even just naturalistically be a very satisfactory way of one writing um, that it doesn't necessarily have to be that, but also you had mentioned to me off camera that Joseph probably would have been even familiar with this idea. He didn't have the term chiasm, but apparently there were people that were, had noticed that there is this structure within scripture mm -hmm. and how it's you know written in, the, in that right. Hebrew format. Can you maybe just elaborate on that? Yeah, okay. So there's two ways to look at it. One is if it was an ancient text he was translating, which I believe it was, then it would have these parallel structures, these Hebrew structures that would come out in the translation. Even, even maybe imperfectly, you know, it's like when you, anytime they try to translate poetry from one language to another, it loses some of it, yeah. but it keeps the same structure. So in that sense, it's evidence of an ancient manuscript, but it's not uh, conclusive evidence because as you point out, other people knew about Hebrew parallelism. They didn't call it chiasmus. They didn't have as sophisticated of an analysis as we have today, but they did notice the repeating patterns and the inverted patterns. And I mentioned this to you, I wasn't going to bring it up, and I might as well, even Jonathan Edwards wrote about all that. So it was, it was well known. Well, I don't know how well known, but it was known, let's say. So for those who think Joseph composed it, I know, um, uh, what's his name, the guy that did the seer stone in, in the hat, or what, what was his book? Anyway, he said that Joseph basically was reciting this from notes that he had. Oh, well, Visions and in a Seer Stone. Visions in a Seer Stone. Yep. That one, it, he, he makes a point of that, that one way to memorize things is to memorize them in order and then you do the other order, which is basically chiastic. So that's all possible as well. But at the same time, if, if it was an ancient manuscript, we would expect to see it. So it's another one of these multiple working hypotheses scenarios, and you just have to decide which one you want to believe. Sure, sure. Well, this this kind of brings me, you know, of course, we bring, you know, Jonathan Edwards, this is the, really what really got me excited about your your endeavor of what you're trying to do is kind of what I find fascinating. Um, and I caught on it early on, the significance of Jonathan Edwards in there. And what I, I wanted to just ask you, so it's been a little over a year now since this book has been out. And um, you've been able to engage people, both within the LDS tradition, but you've also have engaged other Christians who have expressed an interest in your book, and it's actually made the Book of Mormon even more accessible, and Joseph Smith more accessible to Christians as well. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, you know, it has been interesting. I, one of the things that I've done is throughout this process, you know, I first got involved with this whole topic with the uh, Heartland stuff because I wanted to know how we ever got distracted by the Mesoamerican thing. 
And that's when I wrote that first book about the lost city of Zarahemla, the times and seasons and all that. And then one thing has just led to another, to another and another. And I've, I haven't really promoted any of these books that much because I wanted to make sure I had a really solid foundation and solid base and that I could tie all the, the knots or, you know, cross all the T's and all that. And so now I feel like I'm about at that point because I've, I've heard from lots of critics and like just recently, I was listening to John DeLynn's podcast with the LDS discussions guy. Mm -hmm. And as I listened to their hour, you know, I, when I walk on the beach, I was walking on the beach today because we have a super low tide now. It's awesome. You can find. And so I was listening to their, their podcast and I'm thinking this is all a bunch of uh, nonsense, really. It's bad apologetics on their part because they assume the stone in the hat and all the anachronisms, you would expect anachronisms in a translation. It's like, it's like saying that the, the Bible is not ancient because they refer to candles. Well, the original text doesn't refer to candles. The translators refer to candles. And that's the same way as it is with Joseph Smith and all this so-called anachronisms and stuff. And I've, I've thought of doing an article called The Myth of the Mound Builder Myth. Because even Thomas Murphy and, and um, you know, all these guys, they talk about the Mound Builder Myth. They've created their own myth of the Mound Builder Myth. And, and I can't, it's amazing to me that no one's called them out on this, hmm. but that's what, that's my next project. Cause that's, that's the one little um, kind of loophole that I think I need to, <laughs> to fill in. And then I'll be ready to, to talk about this more. The other thing I, I have to mention that when you ask about my interaction with other Christians and so on, I, I don't feel like I'm on a ministry or anything. Right. I, I'm an artist here living in Oregon. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't plan to go on tour I've done some podcasts with you and a few others, you know, that I enjoy doing just because I like you. You're a cool guy. And, and it's fun to talk about this stuff, but I'm not out to create a following or anything. And I, I just put it out there because I get, um, I guess, I guess I get frustrated that people lose their faith in Christ because of bad apologetics, whether it's from John DeLynn or Jack Welch or Dan Peterson or CES letter to me, they're all the same. They're all saying the same thing. They're saying, here's what really happened in history and then you have to interpret it the way we do and i don't think what they're saying is what really happened in history so i don't i reject all their premises and and i've encountered enough people now that i know well who have left the church or at least had faith crises or whatever you want to frame it over these issues that i feel like we they deserve to know that there's an alternative interpretation of all the evidence whether it's christians or whether it's LDS or other restoration movements, they need to know there's an alternative to this Sith narrative. Yes. Like I, I, said, I, I, at, like I said at the beginning, it's the number one problem in the church as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Well, and this is the thing. See, this is, look, some of you are probably thinking like, Steve, uh, you're, you're an evangelical and it sounds like you're an apologist <laughs> for the Book of Mormon. Well, I think that it's really important that if you're going to engage another group that maybe is you're outside of, I do not believe in straw man arguments. I believe yeah. in what is called steel man arguments. I want to take the strongest arguments in favor of the Book of Mormon, in favor of the restoration, in favor of Joseph Smith as being a prophet. And I want to engage those arguments. I want to help build up the strongest argument I can make in favor of the Book of Mormon. And I think that your argument makes the strongest argument because it's, it's, it's mostly naturalistic. It's, it's more rational to go for, for, for somebody uh, from fair Mormon or fair, fair LDS now, to go to me and say, yes, there was this magical stone and words appeared on it. And as an evangelical Christian, you should find yeah. that to be a perfectly reasonable thing. I'm like, no, that no. is, that's the straw man argument. Yeah, that is, it's, I mean, Mormon, the guy who wrote Mormonism in Vail knew how ridiculous it was. And to, to think that our own LDS apologists now are adopting that argument is just appalling. And as a result, people, you know, and really it boils down to faith in Christ. That's the most important thing. And whether you're, you know, a traditional Christian or whether you're a Catholic, Methodist, whatever, or you're LDS, faith in Christ is really the most important thing. And when you have a narrative like the Sith narrative that undermines faith in Christ, it, it damages everybody. And I think it prevents honest, you know, truth-seeking Christians from even accepting the Book of Mormon or considering or even reading the Book of Mormon because of the Sith narrative. 
I mean, I, I think we've talked about this before too. If someone came on my door, I was an LDS, someone knocked on my door, these two missionaries said, here's this awesome book, The Another Testament of Christ. Said, oh, where did it come from? Well, this guy read the words off a stone in a hat. I'd say, okay, I've heard lots of stories and that's, <laughs> that's one of the most ridiculous stories. But oh, the, fundamentally though, it contradicts what Joseph Smith himself said. He said he translated it. If he didn't translate it, then what are we doing? You know, translation so, is more accessible too because we get that. You know, as evangelicals, we, we have the American Christianity has translated the Bible more than any other uh, group. Right. Evangelicals, in particular, um, there are just whole ministries that are involved in you know translating the process. So that's it, the the books you know into different languages. So we understand we we yeah. get translation. We also understand the shortcomings of translation as right. well. And one of the things that I think I like about the Book of Mormon is that you say it's all about Jesus. And I look at it this way. The Jesus in the Book of Mormon is the same Jesus that Protestants and evangelicals uh, would right. recognize. Now, there right. were theological developments within Mormonism that make it a little less familiar uh, to us. Like I look at mm -hmm. some of the later doctrines as sure. being foreign, right? And right for right. yourself. Um, yeah. But... I like the Jesus of the Book of Mormon because it does give us an area where we can have a, a conversation about Jesus. And I even, you know, I tell Christians, well, just engage Mormons with Third Nephi. You don't have to use your Bible, talk about Jesus of Third right. Nephi and have the conversation in, in those pages. And so to me, that's what's so important about the Book of Mormon is that in one sense, it can help a Christian better understand. It's more accessible to evangelicals and Protestants. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's familiar to them. And mm -hmm. I think that they could find great value in studying its pages. Now, I would much rather have Christian apologists who are trying to get people out of the LDS church using the Book of Mormon as an apologetic resource, because at least then they're, they're engaging your scripture, they're taking yeah. it seriously, and you can make arguments. You could use two witnesses. I have the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and these are the two witnesses right. I'm going to use to judge anything else that comes out of the restoration. I'm going to yeah. get off my soapbox now. Well, that's, that's kind of a David Whitmer approach, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I, that's why Gerald Tanner wanted to restart David Whitmer's church. Yeah. <laughs> and I just think how much different his, Mormon yeah. history would have been if they if they did do that instead of walking in Pauline Hancock's church service. And, and doing that, <laughs> perhaps Mormon history takes a completely different course. Maybe so. Maybe so. But, uh, you know, I would love to see that happen. And, you know, to me, Christians are kind of shooting themselves in the foot by rejecting the Book of Mormon because it is another testament of Christ. And yeah, you may say, you know, some Christians may say, well, I don't like the Nauvoo stuff, and that's fine, but that doesn't, that shouldn't prevent them from accepting the Book of Mormon on, on alone. Absolutely. I mean, if, if, if there really was, that's why this myth of the Mound Builder myth I need to develop, because it's one of the objections that seems to be surfacing again a lot. But the, the problem with um, focusing on the Nauvoo stuff is you're throwing out the Book of Mormon, which had nothing to do with Nauvoo. And I think it's important for Christians to take the Book of Mormon. It was a gift from God to the entire world to bring people to Christ. It's another testament of Christ, whether they disagree with Nauvoo or not. It's still another testament of Christ. Yeah, and because it will it, it, bring people to Christ. I tell people the Book of Mormon confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. There you go. Right. And so whether you think it's 19th century or it's an ancient document, it confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I think that is so important. That's why these Christians, the O's of the devil, I said, the devil ain't going to make a book that says Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So, Jonathan. Now, I, let, let me just mention yeah. the, the, the next phase of this, though. And setting aside, you know, discussions about the Nauvoo period. I, I, and I brought this up recently in some classes I teach. For me, the, the fascinating thing about the restoration is how we really are preparing people for the second coming, hmm. right? And, and Christians generally kind of think, well, the Lord will handle that. The Lord will do what he needs to have done. LDS approach is, well, the Lord will do it, but he needs us to actually take action. And that's what I see happening in the church today, regardless of how you feel about this. And I've talked with some, some of this, let's say, senior members of the of the first quorum of, set, or the quorum of the 12 and the first presidency about this. And, and their attitude is, it doesn't matter where the Book of Mormon came from, it's true. And I can see that, and that, I agree with that in a sense. But I think in terms of giving the Book of Mormon to the world, it doesn't fly. Mm. 
But what, what is fascinating is how the church really is actively preparing the world for the second coming through by spreading the gospel everywhere, establishing the, um, you know, the educational system, the welfare systems, all these systems that are really improving people's lives and making a huge difference and, and creating a community. And I just, I hope Christians in general can recognize that what we're really doing is creating a Christian community that's worldwide, regardless of race, denomination, natural origin, any of that stuff. And it's, it's the fulfillment of what Jonathan Edwards was hoping for in his lifetime. It's, it's really an exciting project. That's but what we, I like about you, Jonathan, is because you recognized early on that the Book of Mormon came forth before the church did. So the Book of Mormon does not belong to any church, like you said, right. it belongs to the world. And I also like that, you know, so often I notice that there's all these warring camps within these scholarly communities that are going after each other and attacking each other yeah. and doing snarky things with the research <laughs> papers where they say so-and-so is this, you know, when they do yeah. the silly, silly stuff. And I'm looking yeah. at you and I'm thinking, these people are inwardly focused. Mm -hmm. You're outwardly focused. Yeah. You're looking at a big picture like, well, what can we do to make the Book of Mormon more accessible to the outside world to other christians right. and to me that's a much more i don't know that's a much more healthier viewpoint mm -hmm. to take yeah i think so and you know our internal battles are mainly with the book of mormon central the interpreter dan and jack and those guys who insist on conformity to their mesoamerican thing and it's and as well as the stone in the hat if you if you don't agree with mesoamerica or the stone in the hat you're an apostate according to them and some of my critics say that. And, and I think, how does that happen? You know, I, I just want them to have multiple working hypotheses, to recognize that there's faithful members of the church who have a variety of opinions. As we talked earlier, there's some members of the church who don't think Joseph ever used a seer stone. Others think that's all he used, you know, and in between there's a wide range. So why not just accept everybody, have everybody's uh, approach available for people to choose among, I like you. We talked about my faith model before, where you, you lay out all the facts and then you have multiple working hypotheses and you can pick the one that works for you. But none of that should detract from our faith in Christ and our devotion to Christ and our desire to share the gospel and improve people's lives. And so I, that's why I really appreciate what you're doing on this channel with a variety of viewpoints. Yeah. It's awesome. Well, and I'm going to have Mesoamerica people on here. I'm going to have. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Jerry Grover. I'm going to have got Josh Gailey. Yeah. Come on. I'm going to have, uh, you know, maybe I'll have Dan Peters. I don't know. Uh, either way, <laughs> my point being is I well, want to hear. You know, Dan just wrote an article, apparently, someone told me about how he was, he, we should all avoid contention and all that. And I'm thinking, has he read his own interpreter? You know, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. But, you know, eventually people, when they age enough, I guess they start to realize their career has been kind of foolish. But, you know, I think, um, I think there's a lot of positive things happening and I, I just warmly embrace your effort to share the Book of Mormon with as many people as will listen, you know. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. And I want to thank you so yeah. much for coming back on the program today. Well, I'm ha always happy to be here with you. And by the way, I was going to mention, you know, when we went through the, um, was it the Beehive House we went through, I guess, mm -hmm. in Salt Lake? That was another example of how you and I and our friend went through the Beehive House, learned all that stuff, but if we don't record it or memorialize it, no one would ever know that we were there. Yep. And that's what happens with church history as well. I mean, we have these little snippets and we assume that's the entire history, it's not. And when, when you look past what we do have and consider a fuller context, all this stuff I'm talking about here makes sense. Yeah, yeah, fascinating oh. stuff, dude. Really appreciate your original thinking. Okay. And I just want to remind my audience to don't forget to like and subscribe and also have the notification bell set up. So whenever a new episode comes up on YouTube, uh, it will be, it, you'll be notified. Uh, we're on all the major podcast formats. As I had mentioned earlier before, check out our merch store at morebookreviews.com. For those of you who wish to support us on Patreon and PayPal, we will have links there. Jonathan, this, this adventure continues where we are just yeah. going to continue this conversation. I'm looking forward to the Thomas, your refutation of the myth of the mounds, which I find fascinating. It, it, it's um, the myth of the mound builder myth. The myth of the mound builder <laughs> myth. Now, this is interesting because yeah. Thomas Murphy 
Yeah. And Simon Southerton have authored a paper that's going to be in a major anthropology, anthropological publication yeah. this fall based on my interview with him uh, last okay. fall when he talked about the mound builder myth um, yeah. influencing the neophytes and nephites. So it's really right. cool. So maybe yeah. our interview could also be the basis of a paper for you as well. So you know. I, it will be for sure, because I, I recognize that, you know, someone mentioned to me recently, they think Benjamin Winchester started the Mesoamerican stuff to refute the Spalding theory, which was based on the mound builder myth. So it all comes back to this. It, eventually, even once we resolve this issue, it's still going to come back to the mound builder thing. That's why that's my next thing I need to address. Well, so. sounds great, dude. Well, I really okay. appreciate it. This is awesome. All you right. all have yourself a great day. Thanks again for joining us, folks. Really having fun here. And you have a great day.